Hello my friends and welcome to another Red Gaming Tech video of myself and Marta where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. In case you're wondering where I have been, I have been on a wonderful holiday in Spain but I'm back, refreshed and ready to get cracking. Today we're going to kick things off with a little something from Nvidia as we have some price cuts going on for the RTX 20 series of cards at Overclockers UK which is one of the largest online retailers in the UK. We personally use them to purchase our RTX 2080 tie. So we have price drops on various 20 series graphics cards from AIBs including the 2060, 2070, 2080 and of course the 2080 tie. For 2060 for example can be bought for as low as 29.99.99 which is £30 cheaper than originally and we also see the 2070 being listed as low as £419.99 which is also £30 cheaper than it used to be. And the 2080 is actually down £60 to £599.99. And the, 98, sorry, the 2080 tie, unfortunately, doesn't get that much of a price drop at all. It is down to £979.99 from £998. So yes, it's still a saving, but not a huge drop on what you would argue is the most expensive card. Now, there is a huge amount of deals on various AIB cards. Say 2080, 2080 tie, 2070. So if perhaps you're in the market for a touring card and you're in the UK, now is a pretty decent time to get one if you don't want to wait, because well, again we have some fairly nice price dips on all of these cards. But of course, if you wait, they are going to get to cut more. But if you're in the market. Perhaps look at this, my friends. All that said, however, we're going to move swiftly on to a little something from Intel. Now, what we have here is a Ashes of the Singularity benchmark, which has been published by Komachi on Twitter and of course there's going to be a link to their Twitter post in the description below this video but what does this benchmark actually show well this is going to be Intel's Gen 11 iGPU so iGPU low power so for notebooks and things like that and this is of course going to be Ice Lake just to be super duper clear so of all the nitty-gritty out of the way, what do we actually see in terms of score? Well, you can see that the preset level was low, and this was done on DX11 at 1080p, and we see an average frame rate of 17.6 across the normal batch. That's with one showing at 2.7 gigahertz on Ashes of the Singularity, two cores and four threads we can see there. And then we see another one at 1.2 gigahertz with an average frame rate of 11.3. And that's four cores, eight threads according to Ashes of Singularity. And then finally we see one at 2.10 gigahertz with two cores, four, th uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, two cores, four threads, and then a frame rate of 13.7. But again, this is their low power notebook iGPU. So take that for what it's worth, my friends. But speaking of Intel, we actually have a very interesting report about how AMD are apparently going to challenge them where it matters most. And you might go, okay, what do you mean where it matters most? And some of you who have watched me for a while probably know where I'm going with this. And that is I'm going towards servers and data center because I have spoken pretty much ad nauseum about how important the server market is for both companies. While obviously gaming is a huge part of what both of them do, data center is where the huge big money is, which is why it's been so painful for Intel that AMD have been taking their market share. Although Intel are still in the lead, they are still losing significant market share to their direct competitor thanks to things like Epic. And according to a report from Digitimes, the server most so, sorry, server processor, excuse me, market share is likely to fall below 90% by the end of 2020. Now, this is according to market sources, and this is due to Epic, the strong price and performance ratio, and of course the 7NM, which is coming later on this year. We have seen a significant increase in demand for AMD-based servers, and we did see a rise to 3.2% in the fourth quarter of last year from the 0.8% in the fourth quarter of 2017, and we are only expecting that to increase. As I said, we are expecting to see Intel's server market share fall below 90%. So, of course, they're still going to have the lion's share of the market. By no means am I saying that Intel are going to be losing after this happens because, well, that, that's just silly. 
but they are falling below 90%. And of course, AMD are not just going to rest on their laurels and be like, oh, pack it up, lads. You know, we've got them below 90%. That's enough now. No, of course, they are going to capitalize on this as much as possible. Now, obviously, Intel are very much aware of what AMD have been doing and capitalizing on their issues. And obviously, really, to be honest, it's not just make, taking advantage of Intel's issues. They have done very, very well with Epic. And of course, Epic Rome is looking very promising indeed. The price performance cannot be argued with, in my personal opinion. That's why, of course, people are demanding it, because it speaks for itself. So how Intel really needs to challenge them, of course, goes without saying. They need to just bring out something fantastic to get people talking about them again, while also, of course, keeping the price versus performance at a reasonable level, because, yes, they could very much release a server processor that beats Epic in every way possible or some ways or whatever, but if it's, you know, twice as expensive, a company's going to be like, well, I'm more than happy to take a little bit of performance hit if it means I get to save a significant amount of money, because they're not just buying one of these things, they're buying probably several hundred, maybe even thousands in some cases. Of course, it definitely helps that AMD are getting, what you would argue, some very, very big companies on their side. You know, we've heard all these reports about how they're going to be seeing their tech inside the PS4 and Xbox, um, so PS5, should I say, and the Xbox Scarlet, and of course there's the reports that we're going to be seeing an AMD Epic server powering Google Stadia, so they are doing very, very well for themselves, and it is definitely working out for them in terms of results, so Intel definitely need to kind of wake up and challenge them on this, and I'm sure they are very much aware of that. All that said, however, let's move on to our next topic, which is actually regarding the HTC Vive. As on Monday at the annual Vive Ecosystem Conference, or VEC, HTC announced the Vive Focus Plus, which is a standalone VR headset and is a non-tethered device which has a bunch of improvements, not like it being more comfortable for extended use, and we also see enhanced visuals as well, and we see six degrees of freedom controllers as well. So, what improvements we actually see in terms of the nitty-gritty? Well, we see sharper Fresnel design lenses, which are basically designed to reduce what is called the screen door effect, or the grid of lines that you often see if you have used a VR headset for any real length of time. Now, again, we are also seeing these new controllers, the dual six depth of six degrees of freedom, freedom should I say, was a depth of field then. Um, so we see two controllers instead of the single one that we saw previously with the HTC Vive, and we see more balance, and again, the all-important increased comfort for those using this for long periods of time. But I have left the most interesting announcement that they had for us till last, as they announced something by the name of HTC Streamlink. Now, essentially what this does is it allows the Vive headset, or even or the Vive Focus, or a normal Vive headset, should I say, receive a HDMI signal from any USB video capture card and what this actually allows you to do is that you can play any of your games that are on console or PC so PS4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch and so on and you can also use it to watch videos from your set top box. Now they're not trying to replace say the PlayStation VR with this exactly they're more about letting you play on a larger virtual screen and according to a very interesting report from Engadget it is quite impressive. The only thing they did mention was a slight delay between controller input and the picture, which obviously is an issue, and that is definitely something HTC need to actually rectify before we see this thing hit mass market, but that is something that they noted when trying this out at the event. Now, of course, you do need a capture card to go along with this to use the Streamlink app, but they can be bought very cheaply if you're not going for anything fancy. No, there is not a bundle where you get one with it, at least at present. So, let's finish things up with something that has got me, personally, rather excited as we see something with Resident Evil 3. Ever since Resident Evil 2 Remake came out and has just been resoundingly loved because it is amazing, I finally got around to finishing Leon's campaign the other weekend, I loved every minute of it to be honest with you. It's been basically printing Capcom money, there of course have been reports and rumours that if there was enough demand for it, we would be seeing a remake of Resident Evil 3. And we have a statement from Aesthetic Gamer who basically basically has been right before when it comes to Resident Evil stuff, that they've previously revealed information about Resident Evil 7 before any of the official announcements, and now they have said that we are going to be seeing Resident Evil 3, and apparently it is going to be, it is currently in development, shall I say, but it's not going to be developed by Capcom Division 1, it's going to be done by an outside studio. 
Now, I would love Resident Evil 3, to be honest with you. While it's not as famous or beloved as Resident Evil 2, it still is one of my favourite Resident Evil games, and I did play the hell out of it. I would quite happily play Resident Evil 3 Remake. If it was done in the, st the style and the amount of love and attention and work that was clearly put into Resident Evil 2 Remake was put into Resident Evil 3, then hell yes, sign me up. Now, you might have also had the rumblings that Resident Evil 8 is in the works, and it's going to be for next-gen consoles, which would make sense. And I'm down for that as well. If they continue with how they did it with Resident Evil 7, I think we'll be in for another treat. There was a reason Resident Evil 7 made many games of the year lists, including my own. It was obviously a bit of a departure for the series, and their decision to go first person was a touch controversial when it was first announced. I think we honestly got a fantastic experience. That was still true to the Resident Evil flavour, even with that change in perspective. So... Let me know your thoughts on everything discussed here, guys, in the comments. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time.